it mean to not be shaken? I'm asking honestly, how do you see God as your rock and your hiding place and refuge? Where do you actually find respite from the demands of this outside world? The demands to be a certain way, to have certain things, to perform, to act, to react? Where do I find respite from my own inner world? Of the voices that I say to myself when I say, I am not good, I am not performing the way I should, I am not worth the space that I am taking up. How do we shed the expectations that we and the world put on us so that we only seek to live with God? This week I looked at David, the writer of this psalm, David, who always felt the heat of another's breath upon his neck. He was a younger brother. He grew up wanting to live up to his oldest brothers who called him weak. Who said, you're not worthy to, to fight or represent your country or your family or your people. You can just go tend to the sheep. And then as God's called an anointed one, Saul continued to pursue him. He felt Saul's soldier's breath against his neck. And then when he finally became king, his own kingdom, his sons and those around him wanted what he had and desired his throne. And he wrestled with his own desires. His desire for power and love and respect. Every part of David, he knew what it was like to be pursued. The aches in his joints from hard-fought battles or from crouching and hiding from his enemies, those reminded him of the things that pursued him. His body and his mind constantly reminded him that he needed to be on guard, that he needed to be alert, that he needed to be ready to fight and defend. Always. All the time. There wasn't a lot of time or respite. And then there was the battlefield. The battlefield of his own mind. Because that kind of hypervigilance of constantly feeling pursued or that you might need to fight or that someone is trying to harm you, or see you as less than, that creates the trauma response of hypervigilance, which was always lurking in the corner of his mind. He had his expectations that he had for himself, yet his desires that he had to sift through. He had this hypervigilance running through his body. We know that he desired to be a man after God's heart, to be a good and just king, to serve in his calling. We know that he desired to hold the mantle of strength on his shoulder to protect and inspire others. We knew that David also felt like it wasn't just all about him. As we hear in 2 Samuel, David left Gath, and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress and debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Will you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me here? So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. He had responsibilities. People followed him as a leader, those who were discontented, those who were in debt, those who were in need of a leader, of a savior, of somebody to see value in them. He carried them on his shoulders as a responsibility. 
So no wonder David needed a refuge. No wonder so many of the Psalms that he wrote talk about needing a refuge and a place to hide in God. Because deep down in his soul, his purpose, and his calling, he knew were beyond his own capabilities. As much as he wanted to be the young boy who slayed the giant all by himself, he was the young boy who was an instrument of God. No moment was spared, no battle was fought without the power and presence of God, his refuge and his strength. And he recognized that. Over and over again, he reminded himself of that. So when I look and wonder if I can truly turn to God as my strength and refuge in my life, I'm not having the weight of a people, dis, uh, displaced people on my shoulders. But I know that God walks in the big and the small things with people. And thinking about shedding expectations of others and of ourselves, of thinking of letting go of our burdens, and praying about and thinking about people who were great and majestic, who trusted in God. I found it so compelling and so interesting that this week was the beginning of the Olympic Games. Since I was a little girl, I was never really an athlete per se. I really wanted to be. I tried many sports, gymnastics, ice skating, softball, tennis, basketball, and karate. Did you know I'm an only child? So I could do all of those things. At every scholastic book fair, where are my millennials? At every scholastic book fair, I bought posters of great Olympic athletes like Christy Yamaguchi and Dominic Dawes and Shannon Miller and Carrie Strug and Mia Hamm. I had a Rebecca Lobo Team USA basketball jersey. My love for the Olympics ran deep. To this day, and as far back as I can remember, I love watching the best of the world compete. It's sports that I am absolutely no interest or ability to do, like skiing or running, curling or rowing. And I cannot wait to watch the brand new sport this year, breaking or breakdancing as we might know it. My heart just connects and loves people that just do what they love with such precision and such passion and such ability, such talent and dedication. And I am so grateful. One of the reasons I am grateful for social media is that I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not the only one that tears up at every single event. And as I've aged and matured, I understand a little bit more about the dedication and the sacrifice and the effort, the things, you know, that kept me from going to the Olympics and all of those earlier sports that I mentioned, combined with the fact that I have flat feet and asthma, I tell myself. I am moved at a deeper level by these elite athletes' strength and fortitude and humility. And this year, in this Olympics, there are a couple of American athletes who have stories about how the expectations that the world and then both themselves put on themselves weighed on them and how it made them almost quit or walk away or how they had to name that they had to take care of themselves before they performed again for themselves and for their country. Swimmer Caleb Dressel, who won an Olympic gold yesterday with a men's relay team, said, I knew I was in a spot where it wasn't healthy. I got to the point where I was like, if I don't break a world record at whatever event I am competing in, my career is a waste. I created a monster in myself just so caught up in perfectionism, he explained. 
It's so caught up in, if I don't see these times, it means I'm a bad person. Or I didn't train hard enough. If I don't go for a world record, it means I didn't obsess enough. And eventually it broke me to where I couldn't keep up with what my own demands on myself were. And once he got healthy and spent some time on himself, he fell in love with the sport again and approached it in a way where he was doing it for the love of sport and not for the need to perform. And today we will get to see Simone Biles, the amazing American gymnast, who pulled out of the competitions in the last Olympics in Rio during the Olympics. She says it wasn't easy pulling out of those competitions. People just thought it was easy, but I was physically and mentally not in the right headspace, and I didn't want to jeopardize my health and my safety because at the end of the day, it wasn't worth it. My mental and physical health is above all the medals that I could ever win. And these stories of these Olympic athletes who had to make the hard decisions of taking care of themselves, of shedding the expectations that the world and that their own desires placed upon them, they knew that they needed to seek refuge and they knew they needed to seek rest. Because sometimes we need God as a refuge from ourselves our outsized expectations that we place on ourselves, or to fight the inner battle where we, when we start to believe that we're not good enough, or even worse, the beliefs that we are irredeemable, unworthy of life, unworthy of love, unless we can prove it to ourselves and others. Mother Teresa is attributed to saying, I know God will not give me anything I cannot handle. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. <laughs> I think most of us can relate to that sentiment, no matter if we are a nun watching over the sick children in the worst parts of India. I think we can relate to that sentiment. Times where we don't feel like we measure up to the moment we can't meet it. Be who everyone wants us to be. Or if and when we crack under pressure. What seeking God as our shelter could do for us in those moments. What seeking God as our shelter does in those moments is we don't have to worry about how much God trusts us. Rather, we turn it around and turn to God and say, you are my God. I will not be shaken. I will not be taken over by the pressures of this world. I will not measure myself and my worth and my abilities to perform. Rather, I will only boast in Christ. I will turn to you, O God, because of your Son. Because when you look at me, you see your love reflected back up. For the expectations you have for me is to love and to honor and serve you, God, and your creation. To use the t resources and talents and gifts that you have given to me for that purpose. And that purpose should I seek only with those motivations, with your love and your justice and your mercy and in humility. And if I or anyone else puts expectations on me that distract me from that mission, may I seek refuge in you. For you are my protector from myself and from those who come against me. Some of us in God's creation are called to do great and amazing things, fantastic, way beyond the norm things, reach the pinnacles of success and ability and innovation, and all of the expected glory and honor that comes from being the Olympic champion or the king of Israel. There are distractions and expectations and criticisms and danger that might change your perspective of the weight of greatness. And those of us who are, who are cheering on the sidelines, those of us who are hustling after the workday is over, finding our calling in places with less attention, 
but no less responsibility. May we see our worthiness and our belovedness in God as well. May we measure our worth by the cross and not by the podium or the platform. In our weakness, may we seek God and not despair. We find courage to ask for help, to take a step back, to shed expectations. Friends, the Bible says, if we expect the world to respect us and accept us, they're more likely to see us as fools. So don't wait for the world to give you accolades or acceptance or respect. Rather, may we find the courage to ask for help, to take a step back, to love one another and see who God has placed around us. May we be kind to one another and ourselves. May that be the highest expectation. May we find refuge in the one who delivered us. May we find a solid rock in Christ to stand. May we measure our worth, our belovedness, and our purposes. May we place all of our expectations and hope and belief in the future on the cross. Amen. Friends, this week, we have had dear friends who have suffered loss and hardship. We have had dear friends that have found an inbreaking of hope. We have experienced joy and renewal. We've experienced the every day. Let us come to God no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what season we are in. May we come in God, may we come to God in prayer for ourselves, for one another, for our church, for our nation, and for our world. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Creator God, We come to you this morning, thankful for the reminder that our hope, our salvation, and our refuge is found in you, not in the things of this world, on the ephemeral nature of, ephemeral nature of accolades and awards. places of leadership, who we find ourselves under leadership, but that our worth, our safety, our hope is all found secure because of your son, Jesus. O oh, Savior Jesus, we ask that you wrap your arms around our beloved sister, Connie, as she walks in life without her beloved husband, Howard. I place your loving arms around her and her family. We know that you carry people through grief. You know grief. Lord, may we be a church of compassion and kindness. May we indeed take care of and love our widows, our orphans, and those who are in need. God, we ask that you continue to place your healing hand upon our sisters Lori and Claudia. We continue to guide them in their healing and their recovery. May they find you, Lord, as a refuge. 
a way to endure the process of wholeness. May they find hope secure in the wholeness that is promised to all of us who find Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. God, I ask that you place your hands of peace and protection over all of our teachers, whether they teach in schools or in homes and colleges and seminaries and all places. Place your hand of peace and protection over them as they prepare for this new school year. Pour out your wisdom upon them. Give them hope and renewed spirit in their calling to share your wisdom and your love and your guidance. God, may we all learn to lay down our burdens upon you. The expectations that others have of us that we feel weigh us down, bear our shoulders down, May we walk upright in the light, in the sun, and trust in you that you will help us carry what needs to be carried and lay down what needs to be laid down. God, if we ever find ourselves in a moment where we wonder of our worthiness, of our belovedness, may we just be reminded of Jesus. If you didn't love us, there wouldn't be Jesus. If you didn't care for us and desire for us freedom and hope of a light yoke, of a life everlasting, there wouldn't be Jesus. So let us thank you with open and earnest hearts for your Son who taught us to pray.